for the love of Fatima to Zahra, Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. For the love of Imam Al Hassan and Hussein, Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <coughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the Compassionate, the Merciful, who has created everything in utmost perfection. And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon His pure and beloved Messenger, Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله. <clears throat> and his immaculate progeny of Ahlul Bayt, including the leader of our time, Al Imam Al Mahdi, may Allah hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. وقال رجل مؤمن من آل فرعون يكتم إيمانه. In this verse, the Almighty God states, and a believer, a believing man, from the tribe, from the group of the Pharaoh, came forth. He said something. He made a statement. But this believing man concealed his faith. The verse speaks about the importance of a man who concealed his faith. Sadaqallahul Aliyul Azim. Illuminate your hearts and minds with a very loud salawat. <coughs> There are numerous narrations and traditions from the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, which instruct us to learn from the experience of the enemies of God, such as the devil, the shaitan. One of the most valuable lessons that we can learn from the devil, from this great enemy of God, is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way he wants. You know, the devil, <clears throat> he had a very good reputation amongst the angels. <clears throat> One narration states that the devil offered an act of sujood for God that lasted for 6,000 years. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put him to the test. Allah created Adam alayhi salam. Allah instructed the devil to prostrate to Adam just as he instructed all the angels to do so. All the angels did, except for the devil, he refused. Now the devil, when he refused, then he was rebuked by God, he was questioned by God. He had an alternative plan. He said, oh Allah, excuse me from worshiping, from prostrating to Adam. Please excuse me. If you do so, O oh Allah, I will worship you in such a way no creation in history has ever worshipped you like that. He had this offer that he gave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just please excuse me from doing sujood to Adam. And I'll do something amazing. I'll do something that even will amaze the angels. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a very, very powerful reply. And this is the lesson we derive from this experience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, Oh Iblis, worship me the way I want, not the way you want. Because when you worship me the way you want, you're not really worshiping me. Who are you worshiping? 
your desires, yourself, your own wants. When you worship Allah the way you like and the way you want, and the method that you have come up with, you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping your own self. Allah says, I don't want this worship, keep it for yourself. If you really want to worship me, do as I tell you. This is a great and valuable lesson that we learned from this amazing experience. The faith of God comes as a complete package. I worship him the way he has asked me to worship him. I can't pick and choose. Like some people, they pick and choose. What goes in their interest, they apply it. What they don't like, what's difficult for them, what they find too burdening for them, or if something goes against their own interests, their personal interest, they leave it. And they say, let's leave it behind. The faith of Allah comes as one complete package. I cannot pick and choose. If I do that, then I have not really worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In order for a car to function properly, all of the interrelated parts of a car need to be working. If there is no gas in the car, the car won't move. If there are no tires, the car won't move. If there is no steering wheel, you can't really get to your destination. Every, almost all of the parts of a car are necessary for it to function properly. If those parts aren't working properly or are not there, then the car will not function, or even if it functions, it will be dangerous. I mean, you can drive a car without a steering wheel, but imagine going 70 miles an hour on the freeway without a steering wheel. Imagine into what danger you're heading into. A faith that is not complete, that is not practiced the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants it, can even become dangerous and can take you further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one very important and valuable lesson that we learn from the experience of the devil. We must strive to achieve a complete faith. Now the faith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us has two very important ingredients or components. The first ingredient to having a complete faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to dissociate yourself from the enemies of God. To condemn the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the first necessary part to achieving a very important part of your faith. Without this part, a human being cannot claim to have a complete faith. Now you may ask me, what is the proof? How can I demonstrate using evidence from the Holy Quran, from the religion of Islam, that if I don't condemn the enemies of God, that if I don't keep a distance between myself and the enemies of God, my faith is not complete. The first piece of evidence is the article of faith, the shahada. In order for any person to become Muslim, he or she has to declare the shahada. What is the first point that you make when you are saying the statement? You say, Ashadu, I witness. What is it that you witness? What is the first thing that you witness? And la ilaha illallah. I witness there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this short and beautiful phrase, you as a Muslim, as a believer, are keeping a distance between yourself and the idols and anything besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're denouncing anything besides God. You're saying there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're automatically knocking down the idols. And then you mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you ascertain and assert that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is my Lord. This very brief statement is one of those statements that demonstrates in order for you to have a complete faith, 
You need to condemn anything that is against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, did this exactly. There's a verse in the Holy Quran which states, قُلْ إِنَّمَا هُوَ إِلَاهٌ وَاحِدٌ وَإِنَّنِي بَرِيءٌ مِمَّا تُشْرِكُونَ O Prophet, say to the mushrikeen that there is only one God and I condemn, I seek distance from what you are ascribing as partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the idols that you are worshipping. However, the Prophet, peace be upon him, had to pay a heavy price for this. For him to make such a declaration and to condemn the idols in Mecca, he really had to pay a heavy price. He was subjected to so much pain and pressure to the extent that he said once, no prophet of God has been hurt and harassed as much as I have. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the Holy Prophet. He says, O oh Rasulullah, and listen to this verse. وَخْفَضْ جَنَاحَكَ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ O oh Prophet, be humble. Lower your wings to the believers. وَخْفَضْ جَنَاحَكَ لِمَنِ اتَّبَعَكَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Be humble to those who follow you, the believers who follow you. Then the next statement says, فَإِنْ عَصَوْكَ if they disobey you, we're talking about the believers here, we're not talking about the mushrikeen. If they disobey you, فَقُلْ إِنِّي بَرِيءٌ مِمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ O Prophet, if they, the believers, disobey you, then keep a distance between yourself and them. Then condemn their actions and say that your action is incorrect. This is something that we learn from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran. The first step towards a complete faith is to denounce the actions of the enemies of God. And any act of disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know there are many Muslims today who when you address such topics with them, they immediately reply and say, who cares about what happened in history for me to analyze history and condemn the enemies of God? History is over and we have to focus on our current times. Who cares what happened after the Prophet? This is none of my business. And I have no right to condemn anyone during the time of the Prophet. And there are some who even use a verse from the Holy Quran to demonstrate this point. The verse says in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about previous nations of the past and he says those previous nations are done with now. They're over. They did their actions and you do your actions and you shall not be asked about previous nations. Isn't this is a verse that demonstrates I should close the chapters of history not analyze history and just say who cares what happened after the Prophet. Allah won't ask me about them, it's none of my business. Well first of all, those who use this verse from the Quran, they have misunderstood this verse. This is not what the verse is trying to say. The, first is, the verse is saying that if you as a believer, you have fulfilled your responsibilities, on the day of judgment Allah will not hold you responsible for the actions of Namrud and Fir'aun and you know, the evil ones of the past. Because Allah is just. Allah won't ask you on the day of judgment and punish you for what the Pharaoh did. The Pharaoh, he was an evil man. He claimed to be God. Let me punish you. Allah is just. If you as a believer achieved a complete faith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not ask you about previous nations in this sense. In the sense that He will not hold you accountable for the evil actions they committed. Otherwise, the same Holy Quran is a book which teaches us to delve back into history and analyze what happened in history. Isn't the Holy Quran filled with amazing stories? What are stories? Aren't they segments of history? 
Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come and tell us how Qabil, this evil son of Prophet Ibrahim, stretched his arms and he killed his brother? Why does Allah tell us that? Who cares? Two poor brothers fought with each other and it's over. Why is Allah, you know, agitating this whole situation and telling us about a crime that one brother committed against his brother? Or why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us about Ashab al ukhdud this amazing group who believed in God and there was this evil king who burned them alive. Why does Allah tell us about that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about these incidents so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us a lesson. Why does Allah tell us about the Jews, Bani Israel, and how they used to kill their prophets? How they used to betray their prophets? The lies they'd come up with, how they tamper with the books of God and change aspects of those books. Who cares about these nations? They did something and it's over. But the Quran teaches us to use our intellect to delve back into history and analyze what happened so that I know from whom I get my religion. You know, there are some people these days, I remember I had a friend that I grew up in, with in Los Angeles. Later he left the city, he went to another city to study. A while later I met him and someone asked him, what are you? He didn't know if he was, you know, a Sunni or a Shia. He asked him, what is your madhab, what are you? And you know, he gave an interesting reply. He told him, I'm a Sushi. I'm neither Sunni nor Shia, I'm somewhere in the middle. You know, the bitter reality, my respected brothers and sisters, as humorous as it sounds, and as attractive as it sounds for some who'd like to avoid, you know, the politics of disunity, there is no such thing as a sushi. When you're a sushi, when you stand for salah, how do you pray? How do you pray? Do you cross your hands? Or do you let your hands down? When you pray your salah, do you follow Abu Hanifa or do you follow Al Imam al Sadiq? There is no other way. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. There are many people these days who claim, I'm in the middle, I'm neither or. You can't. You have to be somewhere. Unless you don't want to pray, you, want to, you don't want to fast, you don't want to read the Quran, you don't want to go to Hajj, fine. Then you can claim you're somewhere in the middle. But if you want to go to Hajj, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq has given us certain procedures to do the Hajj. Abu Hanifa has given his own procedures. And Imam Malik has given his own procedures. A Shafi'i has given his own procedures. Who are you going to follow at the end of the day? You have to choose one. You can't say, I'm in the middle. When you say Allahu Akbar, do you cross your hand or do you not cross your hand? You have to choose. And this is one step towards completing your faith. On the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask you, who did you receive your religion from? Give me the source. Was he a reliable source or was he not a reliable source? Did he reflect the teachings of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him? Or did he insert his own opinions? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely hold us accountable on the day of judgment. By the way, the Malikis, they pray like the Ja'faris, like the followers of Ahlul Bayt, in the sense that they let their hands down in Salah. And the reason that Imam Malik, he gives in issuing this fatwa during, you know, the times of Imam al-Sadiq he says, I saw the people in Medina who were the closest to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. I observed their prayer and I saw most of them praying with their hands down. Therefore, I believe this definitely reflects that the Prophet, peace be upon him, also used to pray with his hands down. Otherwise, where did the people get this from? Those people who saw the Prophet, generation after generation, yet they're adamant in keeping their hands down. So even one of the madahib, other than the Ja'fari school of thought, other than the Shia school of thought, also believe in keeping one's hands down. At the end of the day, my respected brothers and sisters, we have to choose a path. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to choose a path. I can't be wishy-washy somewhere in the middle. 
So this is the first step towards completing one's faith. To dissociate yourself from the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to condemn the evil actions of those who hurt the prophets, peace be upon him, and the representatives of the holy prophet, peace be upon them all. The second step towards completing one's faith is to exhibit and demonstrate your love for the people who obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who have been chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I dissociate myself from the enemies and I follow those who love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who are loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is an integral part of our faith. And this is one request that the Holy Prophet wanted from his community. After all those years of struggles, after all those sacrifices that he offered, the Prophet just wanted one thing from his community. I ask for no wage, for no compensation, except that you demonstrate your love for the qurba, for my family, for my progeny, for the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. In one hadith, Al-Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, in this hadith the Imam says, لا يكمل إيمان عبد The faith of a servant of God shall not be complete حتى يحب من أحبه الله Till he loves those whom Allah loves. وَيُبْغِضَ مَنْ أَبْغَضَهُ اللَّهِ And he despises those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala despises. Then his faith shall be complete. On such a night, my respected brothers and sisters, we commemorate the demise of one of the warriors of Islam. The protector of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. The man who gave everything he had for the sake of the religion of Islam. And that man is Abu Talib, the father of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. This man is one of the greatest men who protected the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. He was a man who was very dear to the heart of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. You know, the Prophet grew up as an orphan. The Prophet never met his father. While his mother was pregnant, his father passed away, Abdullah passed away. The Prophet had, didn't have the opportunity to grow up with a father above him, supporting him. And he lost his mother at a very young age. The person who protected him was initially his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. But Abdul Muttalib also passed away when the Prophet was a young child. <coughs> the, the one who protected the Prophet, he gave him a refuge from these evil leaders of Quraysh was Abu Talib, peace be upon him. This amazing man, this wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unfortunately, you see these days some Muslims, they take every opportunity to attack him. And they narrate this hadith in Al-Bukhari, which says, إن أبا طالب في ضحضاح من نار يغلي منه دماغه Abu Talib is in a pool of fire burning to the extent that his brain is frying. Imagine. Such hadith today exists in Al-Bukhari and millions of Muslims ignorantly spread such a hadith and condemn this great warrior of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Talib was a man who gave everything away for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One hadith from our Imams say Abu Talib receives two rewards from Allah. One for being a believer and the second reward that he received was because he concealed his Iman. Abu Talib was once asked why is he concealing his Iman? Why didn't he go out publicly and declare his Iman? Abu Talib says, the reason why I've done so <coughs> is to protect the Holy Prophet. To avoid any danger reaching him. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises those people in history who for a wiser purpose concealed their faith. Doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praise this man, Rajulun min ali Fir'aun, a man from the family of Fir'aun, yaktumu iman, he concealed his faith. After thousands of years, Allah praises this man. Even though this man publicly did not proclaim his faith in Musa, he concealed it in his heart for a wise purpose, for a better purpose. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises him in the Holy Quran. Abu Talib alayhi salam was a man full of iman, full of love for the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and full of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This hadith, which I recited, which says Abu Talib is in a pool of fire, is narrated by the name of Al Mughira ibn Shu'ba. The narrator of this hadith is a man by the name of Al Mughira ibn Shu'ba. Al Mughira ibn Shu'ba was first of all a man known for his enmity towards Ahlul Bayt. So you'd expect something from a man like him. Secondly, all scholars have established and confirmed that Al Mughira was not reliable. And we're talking about Sunni scholars. <coughs> Sunni scholars admit that Al Mughira was not a reliable man. Isn't that surprising how Bukhari would insert such a hadith into his book when all scholars admit that Al Mughira was not a pious man, was not a reliable man in the science of narrating a hadith? How would he insert such a hadith in his book? Doesn't that reveal some of the intentions behind some of these books which have been written throughout history? So first of all, this hadith is a forged hadith. This hadith has been transmitted by an unreliable man. First of all, the second proof that we can use, the second piece of evidence to demonstrate that Abu Talib, peace be upon him, was indeed a great man who had the faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a hadith narrated by tens of Sunni scholars such as Ibn Abil Hadid in his book Sharh Nahj al Balagha, he narrates this hadith Ibn Hisham in his book narrates this hadith Al Halabi in the book As Seer Al Halabiya he narrates this hadith Al Bayhaqi in his book Al Nubuwa he narrates this hadith. What does this hadith say? This hadith is from two people. Two people have narrated this hadith. The first is Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet. And the second person who has narrated this hadith is Abu Bakr, the first Khalifa, according to the Sunni school of thought. Abu Bakr also has narrated this hadith. And listen to this hadith. They say, Al-Abbas and Abu Bakr, they both say, Wallah, they swear by God. Ma mata Abu Talib, hatta a'ta Rasulallah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi minhu al-ridha bil-shahadatayn. Hatta qala ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah, wa ashadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. They say we swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Abu Talib did not die until he willingly declared to the Prophet, peace be upon him, that there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that the Prophet is the messenger of God. Tens of Sunni scholars have narrated this hadith. How can such a man be burning in a pool of fire? Does your mind accept this? You would think, why would Bukhari choose the hadith, the weak hadith of an unreliable man and leave such an important hadith which tens of scholars have narrated? So this is the second proof. That Sunnis themselves have narrated a hadith that demonstrates the iman and the faith of Abu Talib. Another proof, a third proof, third piece of evidence is given to us by our fourth Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam. The Imam says, after the religion of Islam, Allah ordered the Prophet 
that if a woman from the pagans becomes a Muslim, but her husband does not become Muslim, that the Prophet separates between them. Because a mushrik man cannot be married to a Muslim woman. A Muslim woman has no right to marry a non-Muslim man. And the Prophet had a daughter by the name of Zainab. Scholars say she wasn't really his daughter, but she was the daughter of Khadija's sister. But she grew up, you know, with Khadija. She raised them. She was raised in the house of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Zainab, the daughter of the Prophet, she was married to a non-Muslim man. When she became Muslim in Mecca, after the prophethood of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, her husband refused to become Muslim. So the Prophet separated between the two. If you remain a mushrik, you can no longer be her husband. He refused, so she was separated from him. And Imam Zayn al-Abidin salam states, and listen to this very carefully. He says if Abu Talib was indeed a mushrik, a man who did not believe in God and the Prophet, if he was not a Muslim, why didn't the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, separate between him and his wife, Fatima bint Asad? Fatima bint Asad, the mother of Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, was a Muslim woman known by everyone. She was known for her Iman, for her purity, and for her Islam. Why did the Prophet allow them to be together? If her husband is a mushrik, he should have done just as he did to his daughter. Why didn't he separate between the two? This is one further piece of evidence that Abu Talib, peace be upon him, was a believing man, a Muslim man, one who truly believed in the Prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another piece of evidence that we can use to demonstrate that Bukhari and people like Bukhari <coughs> They used forged a hadith in their books to say that Abu Talib died as a mushrik. Is this one hadith? Bukhari narrates in explaining this verse in the Holy Quran. The verse states, "Ma kana lil Nabiyyi wal Ladina amanu an yastaghfiru lil mushrikin." This verse in the Holy Quran states, "The Prophet and the believers." have no right to do istighfar for a mushrik. Then the verse states, وَلَوْ كَانُوا أُولِي قُرْبَى Even if they're their relatives, if they died as mushriks, they cannot do istighfar for them. مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُمْ أَصْحَابُ الْجَحِيمِ Because they died mushrik, they go to hellfire. So they have no right to do istighfar for them. Now Bukhari says, he uses a hadith in his book, he says, when Abu Talib was dying, the Prophet came to him. Several companions came to him. They told him, oh Abu Talib, please have faith in God. Have some faith. Say the Shahadatain, and Allah will save you. I can do Shafa'a for you. But Abu Talib wouldn't say anything. The Prophet then tells Abu Talib, please say the Shahadatain. I shall do istighfar for you unless Allah prohibits me. As soon as the Prophet says that, Jibra'il comes with the verse and he tells him, Ya Rasulullah, now that you know that he is a mushrik, you have no right to do istighfar for him. Bukhari uses this hadith to demonstrate that Abu Talib died as a mushrik. Now here's the problem. It appears that Bukhari did not his, do his mathematical equations properly. Because this verse, according to all scholars, was revealed in Medina in the ninth year of Hijrah. Because this verse in Surah at tawbah and Surah at tawbah was revealed in Medina in the ninth year after the Hijrah of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. When did Abu Talib die? Abu Talib died three years before the Hijrah. He died in Mecca. For those of you who have gone to the Hajj, where is his grave? In Medina or Mecca? He is in Mecca. That means that Abu Talib died 12 years before the revelation of this verse. How could this verse be revealed at the time of his death? This is a contradiction over here. Which proves that this hadith was in fact forged. It wasn't a hadith that was authentic from the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Another source of evidence that proves his faith is his poems. You know, Abu Talib was a poet. And if you read his poems in Arabic, they are amazing poems. 
the level of their eloquence is mind-boggling. In his poems, Abu Talib frequently mentions his faith in the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. For example, in one poem, which is very easy for many of you to understand that I've chosen to share with you tonight. He says, ala What do you understand from this verse? Even non-Arabs can understand this. He says, I am on the religion of Ahmed, meaning the Holy Prophet, because one of the names of the Holy Prophet was Ahmed. He himself, the guy, is admitting that he's on the religion of the Holy Prophet. In another hadith, in another poem, he says, وَلَقَدْ عَلِمْتُ بِأَنَّ دِينَ مُحَمَّدٍ and I have known with full certainty that the deen of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, min khayri adyan al It is the best religion that has been given to humankind. Imagine a man who says with full certainty that this is the correct religion. This is the best religion and he does not believe in it. Isn't this a contradiction? Abu Talib, peace be upon him, in so many lines of poetry, clearly states that he believed in the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Another piece of proof, my respected brothers and sisters, when Abu Talib died, the Holy Prophet instructed Ali ibn Abi Talib, السلام, he told him, go and do the taghseel and takfin for your father. Go wash your father and put him in the kafan. Now you know, non-Muslims, we're not obligated, We're not, we shouldn't wash them, and we shouldn't do the takfin for them, for the pagans. We only do the takfin and the taghseel for a Muslim. That's the obligation upon us. If Abu Talib died as a mushrik, how would the Prophet instruct Ali ibn Abi Talib to go and wash his father the Islamic way and put him in the kafan in the Islamic way? Another piece of evidence that even Sunnis have narrated. The Prophet once said on the day of judgment, I shall do shafa'ah for my father Abdullah, for my mother Amina, and for my uncle Abu Talib, peace be upon him. This demonstrates that he was a believer, just like the, father's, the, the Prophet's father, the Prophet's mother. And there is no dispute amongst anyone that the Prophet's father was indeed a believing man. Another piece of evidence is a letter that Ali ibn Abi Talib sends to Muawiyah. In a letter, the Imam rebukes Muawiyah. You know, the tone was very harsh towards Muawiyah because of Muawiyah's evil activities. The Imam tells him that Umayyah, the great-grandfather of Bani Umayyah, of Abu Sufyan, of Muawiyah, is much worse, is worse than Hashim. In fact, what he says is Umayyah is not like Hashim. Hashim is the great grandfather to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. He tells him Umayyah is not like Hashim. Hashim was a believer, Umayyah was a kafir. And then he tells him Harb was not like Abdul Muttalib, the great grandfather of Muawiyah, was not like Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Holy Prophet, because he was a believer and Harb was a disbeliever. And then he tells him, and Abu Talib is not like Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan was a man who publicly declared his Islam when Mecca was conquered because he had no choice. He was threatened. Al-Abbas told him, if you don't say the Shahadatain, I'll cut your neck. Because Abu Sufyan was one of those staunch enemies to the Prophet. He was behind every war against the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. So if Abu Talib would die as a mushrik, how would Imam Ali say that he's better than, my father is better than your father? And Muawiyah does not say anything. Remember, Muawiyah took every opportunity to somehow bring down Imam Ali. But he never used this against Imam Ali. Because it was a fact at the time that Abu Talib was indeed a true believer in God. Abu Talib, this amazing man who gave everything away for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, for three years, the Muslims, including the Prophet, peace be upon him, they were isolated in one of the chambers of Abu Talib. He owned a place, a small place. And in that place, the Muslims in Mecca served three years in isolation. They were boycotted financially, economically, socially, in every respect they were boycotted. 
the Quraysh made a declaration that no one has the right to go and give food, give water, or be in contact with the Muslims until the Bani Hashim, they give us Muhammad and we kill Muhammad. Then we'll lift the boycott, we'll lift the sanctions, we'll lift the embargo. For three years they spent over there. Abu Talib gave all of his money during those three years. Khadija gave all of her money during those three years. And what happened is when they wanted to boycott the Muslims, they signed a document. More than 40 members of Quraysh, leaders of Quraysh, they signed a document that no one has any contact, should have any contact with the Muslims. And they placed it inside the Kaaba. One day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a small bug, a small insect inside the Kaaba to eat this document. So this bug was eating the document except for the areas where the name of Allah was mentioned. Jibra'il comes down to the Prophet. He tells him, Ya Rasulullah, Allah has sent a bug and it has eaten the entire document which they have signed, which they have agreed upon, except for the areas where the name of God is mentioned. Abu, the Prophet immediately came to his uncle Abu Talib. He told him, Abu Talib, Allah has informed me this. Abu Talib immediately left the place, you know, where they were kind of imprisoned, put under house arrest, and he said, I have an important declaration to make. He went to Masjid al-Haram. The, the pagans were eager to see him. They told him, we hope that you now would like to give us the Prophet and surrender. It appears you probably miss us. You want to come back to your normal life and your normal daily activities. He says, no, 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 that's not why I'm here. I have a declaration to make. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed Muhammad that he, before he tells them this, he tells them, can you bring the document? That document which you signed, which is preserved in the middle of the Kaaba, can you bring it? So as they go preparing to bring the document which was locked inside the Kaaba, Abu Talib says, Allah has informed Muhammad that a bug has gone to this document and eaten all parts of it except for the place where the name of Allah was written. They told him, oh really? Is that what Allah says to Muhammad? He says, yes. He has informed me this. Abu Talib tells them, if he is truthful, if he says the truth, what will you do? They says, if he is truthful and we go and we realize the document has been eaten except for the name of God, then we will let go of you. We will end the sanctions, we will end the embargo and you're free in Mecca. And he tells them, and they tell him, what if he's lying? What if that's not the case? We see that the document is intact. He says, if he's lying, I'll give him to you. You can do whatever you want with me. Imagine if Abu Talib, peace be upon him, was not a believing man, and he had 1% doubt in what the Prophet was telling him. Do you think he'd make this deal with them? Abu Talib, this man who loved the Prophet so much, in one line of poetry, Abu Talib tells the Prophet, O oh Muhammad, <coughs> I shall support you until I am earthed under the ground, until I go under the ground in my grave. A man who loves the Holy Prophet so much, would he make it such a deal with them? Abu Talib didn't see the document with his own eye. He was relying on what the Prophet told him. But Abu Talib was a man full of faith. He knew that the Prophet was 100% correct because he's the Prophet of God. So they told him fair deal. If he is lying, you give us Muhammad, we'll kill him. But if he is truthful, we'll let go. They go, they bring the document. They expose the document in front of everyone in Masjid al-Haram. And they see that the entire document was eaten except for the place where the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was mentioned. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Once they see this, you know, now they have to admit to the reality of the religion of Islam. But their arrogance doesn't allow them. Their stubbornness doesn't allow them. So they say, oh, this is magic. This is sihr. Muhammad knows how to do magic. And that's how he found that this document was eaten by this insect. Abu Talib was indeed a warrior of Islam. 
And it is through his efforts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave victory to the religion of Islam. The reason why till this very day we hear all this nonsense talk about him dying as a kafir was because Abu Talib had one sin only in his life. You know what that sin is? The only sin that Abu Talib had was that he was the father of Ali ibn Abi Talib And the enemies of Imam Ali throughout the centuries have desperately been trying to find one way, one thing against Imam Ali, but they can't. What are you going to say about the knowledge of Ali ibn Abi Talib? What can you say about the courage of Ali ibn Abi Talib? What can you say about his faith? What can you say about his taqwa, about his jihad, about his history? What can you say? Nothing. Because there is nothing to say. History is very clear. So they tried to find one thing. They forged these ahadith to say that his father was a mushrik. His father was a bad man. But at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the truth. And on this night, we commemorate the death of Abu Talib because according to many historians and narrations, he died on the seventh day of Ramadan, which is tomorrow. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this night to give us the iman of Abu Talib such that we truly want to protect the religion of Islam just as he did everything to protect the religion of Islam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to the straight path. We ask Allah to give us the two ingredients of faith, the condemnation of his enemies and the love for those whom he has chosen. My respected brothers and sisters, there are many, many people in this community, around the world, who need our dua. In this moment, let's raise our hands towards the sky and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to answer the prayers of all those who are in need, all those who are ill. Everyone together recite this holy verse with me. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء نسألك اللهم باسمك الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نهدي ثواب سورة الفاتحة تسبق الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah Assalamu alaikum ya Amir al-Mu'mineen